Welcome, welcome. Today is a very special day, Andrew Barry. <laughs> it's because I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> right. And is this, way. Right way for, is this the way for you down there? There we go. Is that the right way? There. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Ginger Meek Allen. I'm a goldsmith and a studio jeweler, and I'm here with my blab buddy Andrew Barry from the Hello. South Wales. And in the sunny United Kingdom. In the UK, yes. And we spell jewelry differently, but we find that we have a lot in common and we love to come and talk about it with you guys. So we have a special guest today. Andrew, would you like to introduce her? Yes, we have the one and only. I like the fanfare. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa Mia. Hey. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to be here. We are happy that you're here. Melissa is um, spells jewelry the same way I do. So we're both uh, jewelers here in the U.S., uh, metalsmiths here in the U.S., and I wanted, um, Andrew and I wanted to invite Melissa to join us today because we're going to talk about learning and teaching and the ins and outs of how to better yourself as a metalsmith um, through learning. And, and also for those of us who choose to teach, what that's like too. So I am excited that we're all here and um, we'll return it. <laughs> <laughs> You can go playing with the props. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. You from Melissa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give him props. Yeah. Uh, I should say that this <laughs> is give us props. <laughs> Melissa, this is your first blab ride. Am I right? This is yeah. This is the first time I've ever done blab or even really seen it in person. I think I downloaded it a while back and I looked at a couple, but that was it. Yeah, Way back so, when. So we'll let you two play with the props for a minute. Get it out of your system. This <laughs> okay? I've stopped now. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. It is a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Um, we have quite a few people watching, a few, and I posted a question in the chat um, box before we, like two days ago, or a day, I can't remember, not today. And um, we've had some wonderful feedback already about how to choose the right teacher for you. And um, I think it's, let me start by saying that the three of us, Melissa and Andrew and myself um, are all people who teach others the in you know the nuances of the craft, and we do it in different ways. And so I'm excited about all of us getting an opportunity to share what that means for us, and we might even tell some tall tales. I'm not sure. It's on the list. We'll see. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by that, but there we well, go. Email Andrew. <laughs> Come on, you know we've got like the infamous. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think it's probably it's certainly true for me, um, and I know it's true for Andrew and Melissa. I'm assuming it is for you too. That I started first before I moved into teaching. I started just as a maker, and you kind of learn how to do something first, and then you move into teaching others how to do it. So tell us how that story went for you, Melissa. Mine's a little different. I actually was teaching computer programming and web development. So I've actually been a teacher of adults for a long time. Um, so that was how I was making my career. And when we moved to the DC area, my oldest was two years old. So, you know, my husband was a student at the time and his nose was always in the books and I'd come home from teaching and, you know, have my conversations with my two year old. And it's like, okay, I need a new outlet. And that's where jewelry kind of started. And the whole creative realm is something that's completely new to me. So to be able to do what I've been able to do still astounds me. Like when I get done with a piece of jewelry, I'm like, what? That came from me? I made that? So um, when we moved to Ohio a couple of years later, I had a brand new baby and I wasn't going to go back into the corporate world. And so everybody was like, oh, you should do your jewelry. You should sell that. And so I started. And then, it, you know, as I started looking for places to take classes, all I could ever find were people who would teach me bead stringing or threading onto head pins, you know, just really basic stuff. And so that was when the first need that I recognized that, hey, you know, maybe I could start doing jewelry. 
And so it was instead of, you know, type this here, don't forget your semicolon, it's hold your pliers like this and twist like that. You know, and so that's kind of how I got started. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that the thought processes are similar in mm -hmm. terms of attention to detail and um, just, you know, being super careful about every single step, right? Well, yes. And yeah. then also, you know, and then taking that, yeah. Yeah, making sure that you've got all of your ducks in a row before you move on to the next stage. Sure. And then as a teacher, you know, being able to recognize when somebody doesn't understand something and come up with a different way to kind of go around their misconception or their misunderstanding to bring it into a new example or a new light. You know, so yeah. that's that right there is probably my talent. I can make jewelry. And, I, and sometimes I make a really nice piece of jewelry, but most of the time it's just okay. But my talent is the teaching. And that's kind of where my passion is and where I really thrive and have fun. Mm -hmm. So, How about you, Andrew? What's your story? Yeah. I, th I think, I think you, you've got to have a passion. And I think that really comes across um, when you're trying to explain a technique or whether you want to explain a process. Uh, you can just do it all parrot fashion. And the person who you're teaching can see that and if you're passionate and you can explain things in great detail and you can answer the questions that they have uh, whilst you're teaching that's 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 what it's all about and what i i object to is 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 some people who perhaps have just done uh just done one course or done university and come out and they think that they can teach uh, all they can teach is what they've been taught but Later on in life, as you go through all the processes, whether you've been um, sort of practicing for five, 10, 15 years, you can understand all the different processes. And then you can then teach whichever one works for you and also explain all the processes and see if they work for that person. But just simply to regurgitate what you've been taught is not right. Sorry. Andrew, I read a quote the other day, and I'm I'm gonna have to paraphrase because I I wrote it down, but I don't have the thing with me. So, um, but it reminded me of you in many conversations that we've had. It was Einstein, actually. Oh, oh, oh yes, go on. Yes, of course, I've often been there. I've often been been referred to uh, and confused with. I think it went something like this: that education is what's left after you forget everything you learned in school. Exactly. That's a wonderful saying. Yeah. Oh and Einstein yes. probably said it better than that, but that was <laughs> the gist of it. You get the gist. It is. When I was in, in university, there was um, uh, a student who had just graduated and became a teacher the next year. And then he was teaching us. But what is he teaching? He's only teaching what he was taught last year or the year before. He's not teaching his experience. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have experience in this trade. Yeah. And you, know, and you really can't do what Melissa was talking about, where you bring, like you're trying to bring someone to something new this way and that doesn't resonate or click for them. So you bring them around this way to the yeah. same thing. But you can't redirect like that and reposition the information unless you fully understand. Right. If you know, it, if you don't know it, well, yeah. Sam, I think that that actually brings up a really good thing too. And this kind of goes towards the students. What makes the good student? Because if you're going to be a good teacher, you have to be a good student as well. And so what does that entail? Because how many times have we ever taught somebody or you get the feedback? Oh, well, that's not how so-and-so does it. So you must be doing it wrong. Or, well, I saw a video and this is how they did it. So you're wrong. No, you know, and I think in, in my own trying to learn because see I didn't have resources available to me to learn a lot of the different things in person in class and I think that a lot of people have that now as well and that's why they're turning to the online training and everything but I was on forums I was trying to find any books that I could which there weren't that many at that point you know and I was on this is pre Facebook you know, or at the inception of Facebook. And so I remember being on several different forums and I would post photos and say, okay, this is what I made. You know, what could I have done better? How could I have made this better? And, you know, we would get the feedback from there or they would say, try this, try that. And so you ended up, for me at least, I tried, I learned a lot by trial and error. So I, I, I've 
I've done all the failures. I can tell you exactly why certain things don't work. But I think that a student's job is to come into a class and take everything that that teacher gives them, not with the whole air of, oh, you're doing it wrong, you know, because so-and-so does it this way. No, you are supposed to, as a student, learn as many things as you possibly can in as many different ways. And then you pick and choose which one works best for you. Some people swear by pay solder. That thing is the bane of my existence. It will not work for me. But other people are like, oh, I use pay solder for everything. I'm fantastic that it works for them, but it doesn't for me. It's not that they're wrong or I'm right or vice versa. But again, I think that people don't realize that, oh, I can learn to do something multiple ways and right. be okay with that. You know, and I exactly. think, like I said, to be a good teacher, we have to be a good student. We have to try the different ways. You know, I've learned how many things from my students when they've come to class because they're like, oh, well, I took this class and so-and-so did it this way. And I'm like, hmm, that's kind of cool. I kind of like that. And then I might add that to my own process. Yeah. And to be a good teacher, you've got to be a good listener as well. You have to listen to the students. The duty is really important. Mm -hmm. I think so because I, who was it? I think somebody had mentioned on this it was kelly she was like so kelly i'm gonna you know read yours it says i love a teacher who is kind supportive encouraging and laughs a lot which you'll never get in my classes never <laughs> <laughs> i had one who was gruff and short with their words and told me how my design was wrong and how i had to do it their way uh nope exactly you know and and i don't think and, and i i can't tell you how many students that i've had come to my classes and be like Oh, you're a breath of fresh air I took from this person and they just took over. They did it for me. They wouldn't tell me what I was doing wrong. They told me I had to do it this way or whatever. You know, and nobody likes to be talked down to, especially by their teacher. You know, they're there to learn and they're paying us to learn. And it's our mm. job to make sure that they do learn. Yeah. Uh, this is why I always buy um any sort of new jewelry book that comes on even if it's just simple soldering and all about soldering or even best piercing the basics i always buy it because there may be something within that book that i think well actually haven't tried it that way let me try it or they're doing it in a different way why are they doing it in a different way um and then i get so annoyed then when they're doing it completely the wrong way and i i get really, I get really really mad you know <laughs> But that's but that's it. But then we can always learn something from 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 even a beginner, because then because they may be struggling with, with a, a way of holding a piece of metal that is so um, that we're so used to, and so pick up a piece of metal and you can bend it. And when they try and pick it up, they just cannot seem to get the right position. But then you can see it then from their point of view that well they're having problems. Well, let's see how how I can you know do it in a different way that enables them to get the same results mm -hmm. i think that that's really important to, to to be on the student side as well as the 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 tutor side i think it's also important as a teacher um just to carry this around to the other side a little bit um i think it's important as a teacher to try i mean sometimes when you have absolute beginners it's it's hard to do this until they grasp some of the concepts. But when you can teach, say, technique and the reasons why things happen the way they do, instead of everybody make the exact same bracelet, exact same thing, you know, if you can teach it in such a way that people can, in, you know, use their own aesthetic instead of everybody following a formula, um, I find that people leave with more of a well-rounded understanding of, of things. Um, and they feel more invested in what they've done because it's really, it has them in it instead of. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I've also found that in my classes, I have a mix. I have some people who I can say, all right, here's the technique, let's try that. But within that same class, I have students who are so new and so timid that it's like, all right, let me just show you how to do what we're gonna do and yours will look exactly like this, and yours will look completely different. Mm -hmm. And I think that a good teacher can also take and balance that, because right. that's a, that's a really hard thing to do when you've got six to 10 students, and you know that you've got to hold these guys, you need to hold their hands, and these guys are trying to be the jackrabbits and like going way ahead, 
I'm like, okay, I'm done. Let's go on to the next thing. And, you know, so for me, I will try yeah. to help those who are the jackrabbits by kind of looking at their technique and say, okay, you know, yes, you have this down, but maybe if you tweak this one little thing, it might make it a little bit better. And by being a little bit more, I don't know, attentive to the details for these guys, it gives these guys over here a chance to at least catch up and get the initial technique. Mm -hmm. And so that's sometimes how I'll balance that. But that one's that one's the really tricky one is when you've got the two different people, this one needs their hand held and this one's like, nope, right. just show me what to do and I'll go. Yeah. Yeah. And at this point, you know, I'm, um, I, I think it, it also, when you're teaching different levels in the same room, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's kind of impossible to do that across the board, mm -hmm. but it's nice to be able to, to so, sort of, What's the word I want? Individualize. Well, I think those are definitely the most fun. When yeah. you get in there and say, you know, let me show you how I do something and then let's see what you can do with it. Those are definitely the most fun. Yes. Yes. I don't have much experience when it comes to, uh, to larger groups because I don't want to teach that way myself. Um, and as Melissa says, it's all about trying to balance it so everyone is at the same sort of level. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I sort of, I vow to myself when I finish my, my degree that I would not teach and I would not teach a group. Um, but I can teach, you know, I've, I've done, when I was up in uh, Sedbro, I did six and eight people and that was all pretty good. But I wouldn't want to do that constantly. I'd rather teach one person, two people, three people max. I can cope. Yeah. With my with my with my little brain, I can cope with that. When you have more people, oh no, no, no. I couldn't cope. And I think for me, um, I've I, you heard the train? Oh trains go in, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um so, so I, 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 admire, I admire trains. I admire what Melissa does. She can she 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 can control a, a group of rowdy uh, students, yeah. 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 Every now and then. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to teach sort of how you do, Melissa, groups um, here in my own studio a few years ago. And I, I don't do it anymore. I do um, individualized things when, when someone requests it. Um, I, I'm also really interested in s sort of the different, like the business side and the marketing side of being a maker. And so for me, I, what I, get really excited about is a sort of full spectrum approach with one person or a very small number of people. Um, Andrew and I, for those who may not know, um, have a, uh, someone, by the way, Andrew, someone came up to me the other day and said, what's the secret society you have? <laughs> and I laughed because it's not a secret, it's, it's a secret. just something that we've intentionally kept very small. Um, it's the metalsmithing mastermind and um, we run on six to seven month cycles and we're in an application period right now. We're accepting applications for our next session of um, MM2, we call it, second session. And um, let's see if I can put that link in here. Andrew, do you remember what it is? Uh, bit.ly bit forward slash, I can never, is it Met Mastermind Metalsmith? Yes, Bitly Metalsmith. Um, did it show up? There it is. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put it over here too because I don't. That's a new feature, and I don't know if. Um, ooh, ooh. What happened? Ooh, I've just downloaded the prospectus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you clicked on it. Yeah, it's I clicked, I clicked on it. Yeah. So um, that is a, a program that Andrew and there's several from our MM1 group. The first group is in the is in the room right now. Um, but we've had a great time. Um, and it's, it's, there've been technique questions and technical challenges as well as business things and marketing and, um, sort of momentum. We've dealt with all kinds of things and it's been great fun. So we're excited about the second round and I would encourage anybody who is a maker, um, an independent metalsmith to go check it out. Um, it's free. We do it twice a year. And um, you get individualized attention from both me and Andrew. So and it's a bit of fun. It's a bit yep. of fun. And the little projects that we set 
sort of every fortnight um, gets you thinking. It gets you making, but it also gets you thinking out of the box, so to speak. Yes. Yeah, there's uh, so D's on here, Mark's on here, uh, Kelly. Uh, yeah, that's who I can see. So they have, are all just coming to an end of our first uh, first session, first Metal Smith Mastermind 1. I also want to put another link in here if I could. Um, Andrew, it might look familiar to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, at thebench.com. <laughs> so um, Andrew is really an excellent teacher, and he has a membership website, a uh, training website for tutors. How many, is it a 1,000 videos? How many is it now? Yeah, there's 1,150, something like that, of all sorts. All sorts, techniques, as you say, techniques and business and tools, um, just on the whole variety. Of, uh, yeah, I've been on at the bench for years. I've liked it. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, You've got a lot I of think, stuff up there. I think it's about six years now we've been doing it. Mm -hmm. You start off just purely as a little bit of fun. Yeah. And then it then it took off really quite quickly, and then I had to really think quite seriously then about it. But I'm yeah. always impressed with your some of some of. I mean, you've got some pretty advanced techniques on there. Um, yeah, I, I could I could go more advanced, but then it's if you go too advanced, you 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 you're sort of missing out on then the people then who are coming on. And I try and keep a balance and not not do it too advanced, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there, there are some 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 advanced dish films on there. I think uh, building a custom bezel for a trillion is pretty advanced. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It's so it's really well done. I would encourage everybody. Yeah. So much. Someone's asked me to do. Um, uh, she doesn't do um, a round stone uh, halo. That's like a nice, nice round center one with the stones and all. Sort of like micro set around the outside. So that's oh, wow. what I'm going to start doing on Saturday. Hey, I can't um, wait to see that one. It's awesome. Uh, can I? Yes. <laughs> um, you see, the prob the problem that I've got is that I can make it. I haven't got a problem with that. Uh -huh. But trying to make it, but make it and talk about it and get it right. Because when you can make things without being on camera and without being explained things, it doesn't matter if it's slightly out, it doesn't matter if it doesn't quite fit because you can alter it and you can, it doesn't matter. But when you're doing it on film, you've got to do it right. <laughs> you can't say, well, that's not quite right, that. I'll do that bit again. You can't. You've actually got to do it right. And then you've got to get, say, the space and the stones going around it. And then you've got to think about, are they the right size stones? Is that the right number of stones? So you're not going to have too many spaces. If you're not doing that on film, it's so easy just to play, but yeah. not when you're actually doing it on film. Yeah. yeah doing it on film is definitely a different ballgame. There's, yeah. been, there's been quite a few refilms on my end. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that just did not work. Let's try one more time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had that a couple times. <laughs> so, Melissa, you mentioned that. Uh, I'm sorry, Andrew, were you? Sorry, sorry, I'm just looking at Mark. He's got thrips. Um, Mark, do you mean, oh, I would like to see outtakes. No, it's, <laughs> at, at the beginning, I used to do a few, but I'm glad to say I don't know. Although I have done a section, yeah, Gabriel, thanks, Lee. Um, there was one film I did a couple of weeks ago that I spent about five minutes trying to get the beginning just right. And I was getting so far and just forgetting it or fluffing it. or So I've, I've got about two or three minutes of me just completely fluffing it, starting, starting. So I may put that online. I've got a few of those. My daughter keeps trying to get me to do those as well. She's like, Mom, a full gag reel of them. <laughs> but no. The problem is having to go back through and define them all. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. oh, we, uh, we, we have a question. Sorry. Uh, Mark's asking about reapplying to the Yeah. Out. And I, I, I thought I answered him and said yes. Um, so Time basically, um, the question is, can, we, can you reapply and repeat? And what happens is, and Andrew and I, kind of figured this out as we went along. The first group got so um, close-knit 
that we didn't want to break them up or bring new people in or whatever. So, so that group is going to stay as it is. It's just that Andrew and I will take more of a back seat and we won't be um, issuing the challenges and all that. Uh, we're still there for feedback if you need us, but um, so that group's going to stay as it is. And the second session will get a whole new group to be in and we will, Andrew and I will be engaged in group two with, the regular challenges and all the things that we did in the first group. So if you're in group one and you want to continue or repeat the challenges or just go through that whole process again, you can apply to group two. We're not going to kick you out of group one. So if you applied to group two, you'd actually be in both groups. Does that make sense? Did I say that right, Andrew? Mm, yep. Spot on. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, we may tweak some of the challenges a little bit, but the content's gonna be pretty similar to what you've already had. Um, but if you like being in the group and working and feeding off other people and seeing what they're doing and all of that, which is wonderful. And if you wanna be in the um, video critique sessions that we have, then you'd need to apply to the second group because those won't happen anymore in the first group. So does that answer the question? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, I have a new link to share here, and Melissa, I hope this is right, but I asked Melissa to share with us um, any online teaching that she has available, and there's a class on Hydraulic Press that right. you have. And so I think I put the link up there, um, the way you sent it to me, the first one, not the second one. Do you want to tell, tell us about that? Yeah, so this was a craftsy class that I filmed a little earlier this year. It's uh, how to make the most of your hydraulic press is the name of the workshop or the class. They told us that it's not a workshop, it's a class. So <laughs> so um, I go through the very basics, you know, beginning with this is the hydraulic press. These are the, the components or portions of it. And then uh, walk them through the different tools and accessories. So using a pancake die, a silhouette die, Bracelet formers show them how to, you know, do a fold form piece and um, and then form that afterwards. There's multiple pendants. You know, when should you pierce versus, you know, should you pierce before or should you do it after you do the forming? Why would you do one versus the other? So I, I don't remember how many projects there are. It's definitely um, fairly technique driven. So there were several projects that are there but it's more based on the different techniques that you can use you in using the hydraulic press. So it's not all involving the hydraulic press. So I talk about certain types of rivets, when to do soldering versus riveting and, and things like that. So there's a couple different connection techniques and uh, texturing, you know, embossing and things like that. So it's kind of fun. It's a, uh, I believe they're two hours. The classes are, it's either 190 minutes or, or it's two hours or 190. See, I can't even, I should just go back to bed now. And it's not even late for me. It's that I've been out in the sun at the swimming pool with the girls and and it's, oh, Andrew, you'll love it. It's 93 degrees here today. Oh. Nice and warm. <laughs> but it's a dry it's, 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 it's a dry, it's going to be far, far cooler if it's a dry heat, isn't it? 93 yeah. degrees here with the humidity we have in the Oh, and it's close to that. So I don't even know what it is today, actually. Um, we're lucky, we're I, love, I love my 70. solar panels. I can run my AC with no guilt whatsoever. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I have one other link to share. Um, and it's one of mine, if you guys don't mind. it's um, I'm starting a more formalized version of my private mentoring program. And here is the link. And um, it's the kind of thing that I was um, talking about earlier, how I really enjoy working directly one-on-one -on -one with someone. And, and um, the, the client would drive the process and it's a private thing. So it's very, it can be very personal and you know, there's um, proprietary information is protected and all that. Um, but it's, so it's, um, because I've been in business a while and I've kind of done different iterations and I owned an art gallery and I have taught and I've um, done wholesale now is my most recent thing. And so um, 
I am excited about being able to share some of that experience and help other people kind of direct their path for their work in both a business strategy way and in a creative development. Because I know for me, sometimes the creative piece has, like I get in my own way because I'm such a um, an artist, for lack of a better word. And that's something I've had to learn how to work with instead of like fight it. Um, and also in the business side. So um, I'm happy to share that today. It's kind of brand new, like this format that I'm doing. So I'm kind of really excited about it. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are they, all, sorry, are they all your books in the background of your picture, Ginger? Books? You got you got some lovely books. Yeah. Not no, not where not not where you are, but on your um your press your the link you just gave us. You know where you're standing there on the desk in your blue top? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I sorry. didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> sorry, I'm on a different page. I do apologize. Yeah, look, 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 there's <laughs> they look some cool <laughs> books. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm wondering if you had yeah. a click. Um, <laughs> Sorry, this is this is this is. Hello. Mom. <laughs> so, can you say hi to everybody? There's a lot of people on there, so say hi. Hi. So this is Kate. She's actually been hi, doing yeah. jewelry camp this week or this summer. So awesome. she's been looking lots yeah. of stuff, huh? So <laughs> that is so exciting. Yeah. Um, nice to meet you, Kate. Nice to meet you. Okay. So, um, <laughs> that, you know what, see, admit, that's why you haven't seen a whole lot of videos from me lately. School is out. <laughs> I get it. And, and my kids, they, they don't, you know, they try to be quiet for a little while, but it can only last probably about 10 to 20 minutes and then they're done. They're over it. <laughs> So, so um, one last little housekeeping thing, and then I want to get to some fun stories because I have a tall tale to share um, that I don't know if I've ever told Andrew this story before, but before I do, Melissa, you have one um, thing on your calendar you want to tell us about uh, that you're going to be teaching? Yes, I'm actually doing a three-day course at the Makery. It's in Bulverde, Texas, which is just right outside of Austin. It's a, a suburb. Is it Austin? No, I don't think it's Austin. Crap, I don't remember where. I just know that it's in Bulverde. <laughs> but it's at Francesca Watson's um, at Francesca Watson's gallery, the Makery. So we're gonna have three days where we're gonna we'll go through all the way from very basic beginner hydraulic press to very advanced. We're gonna be talking about different ways to set stones in there. So we'll do some prongs and tab settings. We'll do some piercing. We'll do layered pendants, um, embossing, silhouette dies, creating your own silhouette dies. So it's gonna be a lot of fun, but it's three days. I believe it starts, I wanna say September 30th through October 2nd. So that part's coming up. That's really the only thing that I have six. left this year. Sorry, Andrew. Does Francesca have six hydraulic presses like you do? Yeah, right? <laughs> Not six. <laughs> only four. I only have two. Come on over, I'll share. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I only have two. I'm feeling really left out here. Well, I only have two set up in the studio. Those two are always set up. And then I've got the two that I travel with. So, and the two that I travel with are the smaller ones. Okay. So you're, you're both big headed. I've only got one. What's that? Yeah, I know. Well, you know, some of us are just <laughs> born lucky. Tool hordes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Talking about. <laughs> well, but, but then again, but then again, we can go, we can guy against Ginger, and she can say well, we can say that we've both got pulse welders. That is true. That is and true. Ginger I just added that last week. Are you really going to bring that up? <laughs> <laughs> I won't rub it in yet just because I still am only learning what I'm doing. But I will say that thing freaking rocks. Uh, that is going to definitely be, I'm pretty sure, a game changer in some of my pieces. Yeah, it, it's not going to, it's 
not going to be that long for me. <laughs> yeah. But are you going to go with the Orion or are you going to go to the other one? Well, are you going to go with the pack, the, the Lampert, or are you going to go to the other side? I don't and know. Do Orion? I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I, I went to the dark side. I did Orion. Yeah. Well, they're just up the road from you, aren't they? They are. They're they're about forty five minutes. Mm. I thought they were. So that's, that's an obvious choice. I Orion was at the snag conference this year, and uh, Puck wasn't. Lampert wasn't there, and so I've used an Orion. Okay. I've never tried the Puck, um, so I don't know. The principle's the same. There's nothing to choose between them. Lee's on here. Lee's got a Puck. Yeah, see, he said that he's got one too. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but there's there is no difference. It, it's all the same thing. It's all the same principle. Well, I think for one question I would have, and this is off topic, but you know, if I needed support or parts or whatever, are yeah. they easy to Good get hands. for me in the U.S.? Um, yeah. Probably. Yeah, Lee's um, Lee had something go wrong with his. I think the display went on it. But he would manage to replace that himself, I think. Oh, well, I think I think you know Lee may say that they were going to send somebody from a film from Germany on a motorbike to fix it for him. <laughs> Seriously, they were. I'm, I'm sure. Um, you know, yeah, they were. They really helped. Yes, they were. There we go. They were going to send a chap on a motorbike from Germany to fix it for him. You can't get better service than that. You can't beat that. That just the yeah. story alone is. is fun. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah, but he broke his foot, yes. He didn't come over. So, so, so Lee did it himself. Who broke his foot? Sorry. The uh, the motorbike van. Okay. Likely <laughs> excuse. So um, I'm going to – let me take this link out. Um, I left it in there too long. And we're going to open up that seat in a minute if anybody wants to come in and chat. Um, but before we do um, – I wanted to see if you guys had any tall tales about teaching, instructional, sort of related things that have happened that were fun or funny or unexpected or um, do you have, like as an instructor or as a student, has, have, do you have any stories to tell that are, you know, the kind that you continue to tell around the campfire years later? You know, I've actually been really fortunate with my students so far. I've not had any real dingbats. Um, I know I've had friends that have had some real goobers in their classes. Uh, one of which, you know, they were, it was basically, I think as she was teaching a basic soldering class. And you know how the tips of your torches get pretty hot, right? And as a precaution, you know, the teacher, when you're teaching a brand new class about the torches and the basics, you tell them, I mean, one of the very first things is, hey, that torch tip remains hot, so be careful. Well, you know, they get going into the class, and of course that has been explained multiple times because she's really good about doing stuff like that. And she said the guy reached down and grabbed the torch head just like that and was like, oh, I think I burned myself. And uh, she was like looking at it, and it was like pretty bad burn, like second degree burnish. <laughs> You know, and she was like, you need to go to the hospital and you need to go get this taken care of. And like, no, no, I'll just sit and wait for my wife while she finishes up the class. And, and so, you know, my friend went over and talked to the wife and she was like, you know, I think he really needs to go. And she's like, oh, he's OK. He doesn't feel it anyway. He's on all these narcotics for this pain stuff. And she was like, he, he just came in to take, take this soldering class and he's on painkillers and drugs. You know, <laughs> she was like, yeah, no. So now she always puts it into her thing, too. It says, if you come to class, you cannot be under the influence of anything. Pain medication, <laughs> alcohol, nothing. <laughs> so, like I said, I've been so fortunate. Like, the, the worst my students have done is go through into their finger with a saw blade. Which, yeah. you know, how many of us haven't? <laughs> right. So I've been really, really fortunate. Like there's definitely a few students that have made me want to pull out my hair. You know, you'll, you'll be talking and they're talking as well. And I'll, I'll stop and I'll be like, you know, I'm kind of explaining this to you. You're going to need to know this. And I'm like, okay, okay, sorry. And then I'll start talking and they'll start talking again. And so finally it's like, okay, we'll just let you do your thing. And then as soon as everybody gets going, what happens? How do you do this? Right. When, what, I missed what you were saying. Like, yeah, yeah, I know you did. 
So that's probably yeah pet peeve thing that I've had happen or my tall tale. But I've been very, very fortunate so far to have really good students that have pretty much been on top of their game. Mm -hmm. So how about you, Andrew? I, I, I've got no tales for students because all mine have been absolutely brilliant. <laughs> And they're all no, online, no, no. so you don't have to deal no, with them. No, no, they, they have. You, you, you get one or two that, that perhaps, that are booked at perhaps three, that, well, there was one lady from, from West Wales who booked up uh, for three days. And the problem is with three days, it takes me away from like what, like what I should be doing, like the workshop and everything else in the work. So I very rarely do a three day, sort of one day after the next. And she turned up straight away and I thought, this woman's not right. And she said, oh, just let you know, people think I'm completely mad. Oh, and she was like that the whole time she was with me. She just drove me mad. Oh, and the problem was that the, the nearest bed and breakfast where she was staying wasn't local. So I had to go and get her in the morning. And I used to have to take her back. And she was just mad. The full three days, she was just, I don't know what she was on. But there we go. But that, that, that that's it. I... I don't do that much teaching, so that's where I'm lucky in one respect, yeah. or, or unlucky. So I got no real tell, tales to tell on students. Well, I guess when you're I'm really born, I have to do apologize for that. She's, wa she's watching now. Perhaps she is, and I hope she is. <laughs> she is watching. Well, she got. She 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 built, and this she is watching. And I love it a bit. Um, yeah, um, and she had a caravan in the garden, and that was cheaper that she could ensure a caravan that she converted into a workshop in the garden, um, more so than what she could have shed. She couldn't ensure a shed, but she could ensure a caravan with all her equipment in it. And she showed me all these pictures of like, like the, the, the toilets in it and the shower, and she had a polishing motor by there, and she had the bench over there, and it was an awesome caravan that was set up as a workshop. Absolutely brilliant. When you when you say caravan, do you mean like a trailer that she could hitch up to a truck and drive yeah, off? Yeah, yeah, like a like a caravan where you you you, you sleep and you take it around to the trailer parks. Yeah. yeah, got it. And she she could insure it. She could insure a shed. <laughs> Ingenious. Uh, so I have a story to tell, a tall tale. Um, it it may or may not be someone we know. <laughs> Um, who's sitting here? Um, but Not it me. was the early, it was the early nineties, and um, this person, it was her first metal smithing class ever, and it was her first time uh, working in silver. And you know, before the class begins, the instructor would send out the supply list and it would say go get these things you know and here's where to order them online and so I think the silver price at the time was less than four dollars an ounce it was maybe 350 360 an ounce and price breaks you know so the more metal you buy the more silver you buy the less expensive it is and back then they may still do this but they would charge a fee for every cut of the sheet metal and so the um, the supply list said to bring 22 gauge Andrew that's about one uh, about 0 0.8 0 0.6 0 0.7 mil I think and um, sheet metal sheet silver sterling silver so this person Whoever she is, um, showed up the first day of class with a piece of sterling silver 22 gauge sheet metal that was 12 inches wide and six <laughs> feet long. <laughs> 12 inches wide and whatever 12 times six is inches long. And I'm 5'10, so whoever she was, you know, I don't know who she is, but the, that piece of metal was longer <laughs> than she was. Tall, or than I am tall. So she shows up and <laughs> she says, and the instructor says, uh, what's that? 
and it was like wrapped in, you know, backed in cardboard on both sides, but it still kind of, you know. <laughs> 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 and the was like, what is that? And and this person said, kind of impishly and innocently, not knowing that this isn't normal. Um, this person says, This is my silver. <laughs> the instructor says, I've never seen a piece that big. <laughs> <laughs> so I I've probably told that story before about this person, whoever she is, but um that's my my best. Wow. What did she think she was going to make from it? Well, it's long gone, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that they shipped them that large, quite honestly. That's they crazy. Do. That's funny. So yeah. when I was learning, because that reminded me, you know, I was learning, and, and I, when I was trying to find classes to take my skills to a little further level. Cause when we lived in the DC area, I took a basic soldering class of here's the torch, here's your silver. This is how you do it without blowing it up and burning it and melting everything. So that had been pretty much my level of experience. Well, I found a class at the University of Akron when, where we lived in Ohio and they had a metals program. And so I contacted the teacher cause I said, Hey, you know, I've already done all of these things with the exception of a hollow form and one or two other techniques. And she was like, that's fine. No worries. So they just let me go, you know, skip that beginning one and go into the advanced one. But I wanted to learn how to do a hollow form. So I thought, okay, well, I've got my dapping set. I'm going to make a bead. And, um, you know, I knew the basics. You take your two domes and you stick them together and you run your solder, right? And I ended up with the most perfect little lentil. And I was so excited. And I went and showed my jewelry forms that I was on. And I'm like, look, I made it. I made it. And everybody's like, that's great. Where, where's the hole? And I said, oh, I haven't put it in there yet. I haven't figured out where I want it. And everybody's like, huh. And it didn't blow up. And I'm like, what? Why would it blow up? <laughs> and they're like, you're very, very fortunate. And then, <laughs> and so then later, uh, after I was in one of the, the classes there at the University of Akron, I had a piece and the dome, and I didn't solder it on because we were just doing um, resin. And so I had my back plate and I put the dome in here and I put the resin on it and the resin didn't cure. So we were burning out the resin and all of a sudden you hear <laughs> This loud bang, then it's worse than a gunshot. Like when we're talking like a high caliber gunshot, and then you hear this little tink, tink, tink. <laughs> and the little that little dome had fused onto the back plate while we were soldering or while we were burning out that resin and then exploded and blew up. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so that's what they meant oh, by wow. things will blow up. Okay. <laughs> so I've always, whenever I do my bead making classes, I the very first thing we do is we start a hole. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. spirit hole. Yeah, I have one of those too where I soldered. Two. I had a, an instructor um, several years ago, my my mentor, who um, said, you know, that you actually can not put a hole in if it's the first heat if it's the first time and I still don't recommend that people try that but I did and it worked um, but I think if you were ever going to heat it again you have to have a you can't have a closed form but in general it's a good idea well, I just thought <laughs> it was really cool because I watched sure. the solder go all the way around and as soon as it touched I stopped and I'm like oh I did it you know and I was thrilled but and then I like yeah. I said then I found out that Maybe I should find a different way. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Um, well, I just opened up the seat, and I would love um, to invite anybody who's here who wants to come in and have a chat with us. We've got a little bit of time left, and uh, we would be happy to answer any questions that you have or hear stories, your own tall tales about classes that you've taught or classes that you've been in. And um, and if anybody has questions about how to get into teaching, maybe we could talk about that. Um, I don't know. You guys are up for that. Um, but yeah, open seat, open open point in the combo here. To have a chat, see them. 
I know I know a few of you've been on already. <laughs> but yeah, but, 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 you know, whilst people are deciding, yeah, if going back to the hollow form, yes, it is really important, especially if you're melting anything down, melting silver down, melting gold down, make sure that there is nothing hollow, completely hollow when you're melting down. Always pierce it, snap it, bend it, poke a scribe through it. Something That's to let the air I wouldn't out. even thought about that. I mean, maybe I would have when I went to go melt things down, but. Yeah. Because it, it, it has happened to one of the guys who, who uh, was working for us. He couldn't wait for me to supervise him melt down, and, and, and he just carried on doing it. And there's a small little uh, hollow ball stud at the bottom of it when he was melting it. And, of course, melting, 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 the top starts to melt. The bottom hasn't melted, but the air heats up so quick it exploded, and the, the, it was gold, actually, and it went up into his eye and all over the workshop. Ooh. So... He, he had a week or so off work with putting drops in his eye and and that sort of thing. And these things happen, but, you know, you've got to make sure that, you know, it, it is funny when you think back about it, but it is a very serious thing. You've got to make sure Golden that you... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Cheers for that. There's, there's uh, quite literally. Luckily, and then, yes, obviously, safety first. Whenever you're melting down or anything that way, safety glasses, in theory... Yeah, but it, it is very dangerous. Always make sure that you, that you break it, snap it, bend it, put a scribe through it. Make sure the air can get out quick. Because if it can't, it will explode. Sorry, I just wanted to, to say that in case. No, that's good. Like I said, I wouldn't, I mean, again, when I was going to melt stuff down, I'd probably think about it if I saw that I had a, a hollow form piece. But otherwise, I didn't yeah. think about that. Yeah, really important. So, uh, so is Kelly coming on in? Yeah, come on, Kelly. I hope so. Kelly? <laughs> Kelly, <laughs> Kelly. Here she comes. Oh, good. You let her yep. in, Andrew? Yep. There she is. Hi. I'm. It looks like, hey, there you guys. Hey, Hi, Kelly. Kelly. I was soldering while listening Hi. to you guys. I figured I'd pop down and share my little tiny little story here. Yeah, it's, please do. It's kind of Tell comical, kind of gross, it. but kind of like, oh, you need to hear it. <laughs> kind of like the blowing up thing, but i Hey, wait, wait one second. Everybody, this is uh, Kelly Hi. at Mothers on the Mountain Jewelry. Working. And, okay, so. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> a fellow student slash instructor um, a number of years ago, uh, and he's, older than me, but an instructor and jeweler longer than me, um, went over to the, oh gosh, now I'm going to forget the machine, the big machine that can cut nice big six, six foot strips the of silver. Shears or the, yeah, the big shears. Here. So he went over there with all this experience with this little piece of metal and went to go cut it, put his hand underneath to catch it. No, no, no. So now there's a sign right next to this saying, do not catch your metal and there's a picture of a little finger coming off because he like went up to the teacher and went um um that's what we did and, then, <laughs> and he's okay and he can still make beautiful jewelry but it was like oh my gosh you know those times when we we, we know what we're doing but we're just like oh I'll just catch it it's no biggie right no so that was my little oh my gosh and that's he's awesome. Like, awesome. yeah he's, he's fine he got all the nerve that there was no nerve damage but um the, the new people come in and they look at that sign and they go, yeah, right, really? And we're all, no, there's a guy right there. You want to talk to him? And they're all, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> oh, it's that's really like I always say I undo my saw blade when I'm done with it. And people go, why? And I'm like, you want to grab it all tight and cut your finger? So that was my little yeah. story. <laughs> yeah. I think it, it's my mentor was missing a finger. And she lost it polishing a chain on a bumping wheel, uh, which is also dangerous. I mean, sometimes, yeah. So she, I mean, and it's, it's not, there's nothing like having an instructor who, you know, is, I can't, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> um, yeah, and it's and it's sort of like like when you were talking, I could sort of kind of tell where that story was going, and I, I was like, oh no, don't do it. <laughs> we, we only got the tip. You only because, got the tip at least. So, 
I like my fingertips. But what, what she's, you know, it's nothing like Marianne would, you know, all she had to do was hold up that hand and you were like, you never forget, <laughs> you know, it's a good wow. reminder. Um, See, I appreciate people yeah. who make and polish chain so much more now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are ways to do it safely. Um, but I have always told my um, studio assistants or interns or, you know, anybody who's working for me, if you're standing at a polishing motor and your brain goes anywhere else, you got to step back because that, that is a dangerous machine. And if you aren't focused and 100% present and aware and, and conscious of what you're doing, it only takes you know what, a second. See, I think and that lessons. is so important. I think people see, especially, you know, cause I do, on my YouTube channel, which, you know, I don't know if we want to share that too, but on my YouTube channel, I do all the different tool reviews and things like that. And I'll show people how to use various tools. And that's actually how it kind of got started for me, Tool Time Tuesday, because I had all these tools in my studio that I didn't know how to use. But I bought them because I was making jewelry and I thought you were supposed to buy these tools. And so, you know, and now that there's like a million things to choose from on all these different things. And so, but I think that people also see that you know they'll see us using something and we've already kind of mastered that so we make it look very easy and so they think oh well then all you have to do is just go zoop, 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 and have everything kind of go that way when they don't realize the skill that we've taken to learn that tool and even though it looks easy you know and, and that's one of the things too i always tell my students look i'm going to teach you guys how to use this tool but you have to respect you've got to give that tool the respect that it needs otherwise it's going to take your fingers it's going to take you know whatever it'll take your piece it'll take your fingers it'll take whatever and you're not going to have that so yeah, i think that's really important and i i would dare say that a lot of people who are here on on this already kind of understand the respect that you need to give the tools yeah. but that's one of the things when i get new students you know, especially, and it was very eye-opening to me when I taught at my daughter's high school, because all of a sudden I had a class of 12 high school kids, junior high and high school kids, you know, and I was taking in my hydraulic presses, I took in torches and saws and hammers and all sorts of stuff, you know, and I had to be really on top of them and be like, hold it, don't you dare use that without, you know, this or without that, and, you know, and I think that'll... I, yeah, I don't know. Because you know, there, there are lots of sorry, there are lots of tools that could kill you. Really, if you don't, if you don't respect them, especially Ginger was saying with the, the the polisher motor, you've only just got to have a, a split second lapse of concentration, and and if you're polishing something, you'll whip it out from your hand, and it'll completely undo hours and hours worth of work not just the work but it can take your hand into the mops and this just too scary to even consider so as you said I have, some, step back. I have something to add that because a lot of people think everybody has these big polishing motors i have a little one and i just want to put out there you still have to give the same respect to it no matter what the size the big polishing guy is because it can still i've had little pieces mm -hmm. fly off into over there into carpentry carpentry land i haven't found them and I'm lucky to have, you know, it, even though it's little, it can still be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I had a, the last chain incident I had was polishing and it was a chain that I made and it was a pretty chunky, like sturdy, it wasn't like this little tiny delicate thing and I wrapped it around a, um, a block with grooves in it, you know, as you do. And it still snagged it and part of, Part, I think part in part because it was it had big edges on it and it just snagged one of those edges and I it did wrap around my hand but it didn't hurt me other than break my chain and I had to go make again um, <laughs> so I think and it, it, even as long as I've been doing this and knowing you know what I know about it I still things will happen sometimes that make me go oh yeah, when, yeah you know remember yeah, you still have to kind of remind yourself. It's easy sometimes for us to get uh, a little com too comfortable, 
I think sometimes we get, as Mark says, we get so familiar yeah. with it and you feel a sense of mastery over that technique. And that's, um, it's also important to re remain, okay, like you yeah. said, respectful of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. The other one that always yeah, gets, no, sure. I can't say it always gets me. It gets me every now and then is I have a little drill press, you know, and I'm working with little itty bitty, teeny tiny, uh, drill bits drilling down into a piece and every now and then that will still grab it's like okay yeah we got to remember to you know hold it a little differently and stuff like that because it'll zing you I was fortunate I was doing something and I think I jumped to too big of a drill bit too quickly you know because I usually start off really small and then it'll gradually get bigger but I it grabbed it and stung me and I was really fortunate that it didn't cut but it was again one of those things that you know, you start to get lax because you're like, oh, I know how to drill a hole in a piece of metal with a little tiny drill bit. Yeah. And also from a teacher's perspective, you mentioned, you know, teaching, was it in your daughter's school? Um, I did a hands-on demonstration, shall we say, in a kindergarten class. And I took my anvil and uh, just a lightweight chasing hammer and the children were you know, I had their hands in my hands. So I was the one really doing it, but their hands were there. And it was a special needs um, classroom of five and six year olds. And um, nobody got hurt, but you know, it, it's, it's doing something like that really kind of, the teacher kind of takes on, I felt oh. responsible yeah. for them. Yeah. Um, that they were not, hurt or that they hammer they didn't hammer their fingers or anything like that and i also did a um a long range a long-term thing with a high school chemistry teacher several years ago where they were doing um anodizing and um i she brought me in to teach the forging and forming part and then the chemistry teacher they were doing anodized rings and earrings and loopy parts and and um, they were high school students. But again, you know, there was I still felt like I if I wanted them safe and I felt responsible yeah. for their safety. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so, those little fingers. When you have an adult who's going <laughs> to grab a hot torch, apparently <laughs> some. <laughs> Kelly, I was just thinking something? the little fingers I was listening to and I was, you know, thinking I was showing my, my niece who's 10 with tiny little hands, the lapidary. And I'm like, don't rub the knuckle on the other grit. That's like 220. Don't rub the, and I'm like standing over her. Just, I mean, the wheels are this big, her hand is that big and feeling responsible and not wanting to look away just in case and double checking that I've showed her all the safety things and, you know, and she's like, I got it, auntie, whatever. <laughs> Comfort, yeah. yeah. So, well, I got to get um, back to soldering. Oh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pop off, guys. Okay. Good to see you, nice Kelly. To see you, Kelly. All right. Bye. 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 All right. I think we're about ready to wrap up, unless anybody has um, anything else they want to want to add to this conversation. It's been a great a great time. Um, uh, Mark Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> a man of many words no i just think it's um i think we are in one respect quite fortunate to be able to pass on what we have learned on to the next generation and then hope then they will pass it on to the next generation and so on and so forth and that's the only way that i think this profession will actually uh, survive because a lot of people, we're so fortunate now too with all of the media that we have. I mean, Andrew, you're so, sitting over in the UK. You're mm -hmm. over at where are you, North Carolina, Ginger? And I'm out in Utah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and we can learn from each other. I love the day and age that we live in now. It's it's, it's amazing how Absolutely. fast and how quick this signal is traveling five, six thousand miles back and forth, back and forth. It is amazing. Absolutely amazing. I had a, a client, uh, hopefully going to be a client. Uh, I was talking with a lady who found me on the internet and um, talking about doing a custom ring. And, and she and I really kind of clicked and we were chatting about things. And she said, 
I love the internet. <laughs> and it was just like, yeah, I mean, it is. It's an amazing time to be alive. And especially, I love the dichotomy for us with we're practicing an ancient craft, you know, especially doing it by hand the way we're doing it. I mean, with the occasional hydraulic press. But, you know, um, in the 1700s. It's <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. But it's an, it is. It's an amazing time to be alive that we can all sit here and we have so much in common and so much to share and learn from each other. And we're sitting here. I'm, I mean, I'm drinking a glass of tea and talking to you guys. <laughs> so I think that's pretty yeah. awesome. I'm down my parents' yeah. house waiting to pick up my girls from uh, from a rock concert. <laughs> but it is. But, but we're not restricted to um, a printed medium anymore. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you know, we did DVDs a few years back, sort of like ten years back, and even those now are being so they are so outdated because the internet's out there and everything can be refreshed. You're not limited to you know hour and a half on a on a CD or a DVD. You can have unlimited streaming and so much now. So I'm just wondering what the next is going to be. If this is what has happened over the last 20 years, what's the next 20 years going to be like? I'll be able to send a drone over and, and watch yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not how that one's done. No, no, hold your torch this way. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to know, though, that also brings up the other point, too. There's a lot of really bad people, technique-wise, making videos you know yeah. there's a lot of really yeah. bad information and the, there's there's a couple in particular that i know of and they come across very charismatic they have a lot of confidence but the information is very bad and that scares me mm. you know because mm -hmm. again they sound like they know what they're doing and so you get that information out there and again those are one of those well so and so says you should do it this way and no. Well, one of, one of the things that's interesting to me, and it, I mean, we're seeing, we as a culture um, on the planet um, that have the internet, not everyone has the internet on the planet, I guess, but it's, it's, it used to be for information to get distributed, you had to go through a publisher or a broadcaster or like you had to, and there was yeah. a vetting, I think. Yeah. that was built into that. Now everybody who wants it has hmm. a channel. Or I mean, we're yeah, standing here, nobody gave us, yeah. yeah, I mean, I didn't ask mm -hmm. anybody. We right. just did this, right? And so, um, so what does that mean? I mean, I think um, it, it's, I now know that like, I have this distant cousin that I disagree with on pretty much everything. <laughs> and I'd never knew that before. But now because of Facebook, you know, uh, I'm making that <laughs> up. No. But um, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, it is an it raises an interesting question: yeah. Who's responsible? You know, are, is the is the consumer who's like taking the information in? Is that the person who's responsible? Um, I think to some degree we are. You know, we we. We're responsible for what we put out there, but for me to, if I'm learning for the first time and I find the first person I find is going to teach me that I can solder a hollow form without a spirit hole or that I can just walk up and hold a chain in my fingers on a polishing motor. Well, I, you know, I, suppose, um, I suppose everybody has been out there to tell you the, what they think is best, whereas in the past you've had a book to read as you say, it's been vetted, it's been made sure that all the facts are correct. But I suppose people have still been out there, been able to tell you the technique that they know is completely wrong. And now the problem is it's just so freely available now as opposed to on a one-to-one. -one. So you say you put a film on YouTube and within a couple of days, thousands of people can view it. What am I trying to say? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's the only thing that's changed is the way that the information has been broadcast as you say there is no betting so, and you could say one thing but then you know i could tell you to go and put your hand in the fire 
And you go, oh, Andrew, that hurts. I said, well, I know it's going to hurt. Why did you do it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it occurs to me that, um, and I didn't, I didn't share my entire story today, but I have a journalism degree. Like that's my background. It's, I, we were taught you have to have three, you have to validate yes. whatever yeah. information you get. You know, before you put something out there, you're the one vetting it. You're the one saying, I found this same piece of information in three different sources and they're all yeah. reliable sources. And anything that, anything other than that got put in quote marks and attributed to some one person. So it's, it occurs to me that we kind of all have to be journalists in terms of what we choose to believe when there's information yeah. out there, um, mm. check it out, oh, you know? And, and, and there's such a wealth of information now. You really can, um, especially if you're trying to teach yourself something like metalsmithing, having more than one source is yeah. a good idea. Definitely. I yeah, and then it's well, up to and the and individual to, to take in what they want then. Yeah, well, yeah, and it goes back yeah. to what I was saying. You know, I always tell my students, you know, it's your job to take the same class from as many people as you can because you're going to learn different things from every one of them. So yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Well, on that philosophical note, I think we have covered it today. I don't know about you guys, but mm, it's very I've good. enjoyed this. this. So thanks for having me. This is fun. That's okay. It, it's Thank just like being back in what? Vegas, but without the chocolate cake. Well, when we go to Vegas, and next time we'll have Ginger there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, and then I think the three of us yeah. might, well, no, we still probably couldn't polish that thing off. <laughs> it was Oh, big. my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll we'll have to, like, save up, I guess, um, for the next year's <laughs> chocolate cake. Um, yeah. And um, thanks, everybody, for, yeah, for joining you. us. And yeah, and again, uh, real quick, uh, you can find me at gingermeekallen.com, Andrew Berry at thebench.com, melissamuir.com, melissamuir.com, M U I R, mm -hmm. right? So we would love to hear from you. The replay will be on YouTube um, tonight or tomorrow. And thanks so yeah, much. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Thank you for coming, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks for having Bye. me, you guys. You're welcome. Bye.